Not dinner bells. Good morning. So lovely to see all of your faces. Welcome to the Unitarian Church. My name is Eric The Unitarian Universalist Faith is a creedless community dedicated to a free and responsible search for truth and meaning. We embrace a pluralist philosophy, opening our hearts and minds to the diverse ideas, feelings, and expressions of our world community. Whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, you are welcome here today. We respectfully acknowledge that we are located on Treaty 6 territory a traditional gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakota Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ojibwe, Saltu, Anishabi, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant community. We ask that you take a moment now to ensure that your cell phones and noise emitting devices are silenced. And for those who are hearing impaired, do we have um, audio aids still available? Anyone? Yes, we do. And somebody that is more competent than me could help you with that, I'm sure, in the back somewhere. <laughs> We're glad to have you with us this morning. We hope you find something in the service today that nourishes your spirit and helps you find and keep your balance. We open the service now with a musical prelude, offering each of us a time of quiet contemplation and inspiration. Our prelude today is Here Together by, I think, David Glasgow, because this writing, eh, maybe. <laughs> Lovely, thank you. Daniello is going to come up and help me light the chalice this morning. And this is his first time doing this. He's going to come over and light both the candles. We have our regular chalice, and we also have a candle for Ukraine and for their continuing struggles. And we keep them all in our hearts. Kindle the flames of love where people's sorrow reign. Tell the happy story of those who overcame sorrow. Smell the flowers of faith. Breathe the air of love. Open your soul to the streaming rays of the sun. Join your heart of solace with those who suffer. Send your warm sympathy to your fellow human. 
And now we will sing hymn number 188, Come, Come, Whoever You Are. Sing it three times. Okay, so what a wonderful time we're having already. Thank you for being here. Good morning, my name is Reverend Rosemary Morrison and it is my pleasure and honor to serve this congregation. I'm gonna read you a story called The Curious Garden. And I'll show you the pictures like this, but not they won't be big because, well, you can ask me later. <laughs> there once was a city without gardens or trees or greenery of any kind. Most people spent their time indoors. As you can imagine, it was a very dreary place. <laughs> However, there was one little boy who loved being outside. Even on drizzly days while everyone else was stayed inside, you could find Liam happily splashing through his neighborhood. It was one such morning that Liam made several su surprising discoveries. He was wandering around the old railway, as he did from time to time, when he stumbled upon a dark stairwell leading up to the tracks. The railway had stopped working ages ago, and since Liam wanted to explore the tracks, there was only one thing for a curious boy to do. Liam ran up the stairs, pushed open the door, and stepped out onto the railway. The first thing he saw was a very lonely patch of color. Wildflowers and plants were the last things he had expected to find up there. But when he took a closer look, it became clear that the plants were dying. They needed a gardener. Liam may not have been a gardener, but he knew that he could help. So he returned to the railway the very next day and got to work. The flowers nearly drowned, and he had a few pruning problems, but the plants patiently waited while Liam found better ways of gardening. As the weeks rolled by, Liam began to feel like a real gardener and the plants began to feel like a real garden. At the beginning of the book, the pictures are all very dreary and each page there's more and more color. And I will leave this book lying around if you wish to look at it after. Most gardens, they stay in one place. They kind of stay where you put them, but this was no ordinary garden. With miles of open railway ahead of it, the garden was growing restless. It wanted to explore. The tough little weeds and mosses were the first to move. They popped up farther and farther down the tracks and were closely followed by more delicate plants. Over the next few months, Liam and the Curious Garden explored every spot 
on that railway. Oh, there's another picture. I'm sorry, it's hard for you to see, I know. Copyright. After spending his spring and summer and autumn with the garden, Liam's time on the railway was finally interrupted by winter. Heavy blankets of snow fell on the season, on the city that season, and for the first time he'd become a gardener, Liam could not fin fin visit his plants. Lots of snow. This is set in New York City, by the way. Rather than waste his winter worrying about garden, about the garden, Liam spent it preparing for spring. After three cold months, we scoff at three cold months, don't we? <laughs> After three cold months, the snow finally began to melt, and Liam rolled his new gardening gear over to the railway. Winter had taken a toll on the garden, but thanks to Liam's planning, his handy new tools and a little help from the sun, the plants soon woke up from their winter sleep. The garden had always wanted to explore the rest of the city and that spring it was finally ready to make its move. Once again, the tough little weeds and mosses, they set out first. They popped up farther and farther from the railway and were closely followed by the more delicate plants. The garden was especially curious about old forgotten things. And in the picture is a, um, an old forgotten truck covered in mosses and flowers. A few plants popped up where they didn't belong. One was over a stop sign. The other one and more plants on the fire hydrants and others popped mysteriously up all at once. But the most surprising thing that popped up was, was more gardeners, new gardeners. Many years later, the entire city had blossomed, but most of all, the new gardens. Liam's favorite was where it all began. So this is a fictionalized account of the High Line Railway in New York City. It was an abandoned railway. Um, it was abandoned in um, 1980. It was shut down and forgotten and became derelict. Um, and then over the years, people have actually started, this is kind of a true story, people have actually started gardening on the High Line and there's community gardens and there's walkways and there's benches and there's all kinds of things up there. And um, so he says, from grass bursting through cracks in the sidewalk or a tuft of goldenrod clinging to a brick wall to a meadow winding along an abandoned railway, nature can thrive in the most unlikeliest of places. The Curious Garden by Peter Brown, a lovely little book. And I will leave it here. So have a look at it if you like. And what's next on our agenda? <laughs> I think we're going to sing a song. Spring has now unwrapped the flowers. Hymn number 63. The words will be here, they'll be on your screen for the folks at home, and then you are welcome to rise in body or in spirit to sing hymn number 63. Hymn, the spring has now unwrapped the flowers.
I just have to find that face. <laughs> One of the purposes of this church community is to encourage all who gather here to grow more generous in spirit and action. In addition to supporting this community, we also make a monthly commitment to the wider community. One half of the unidentified cash that is received is given to an outside organization. For the month of June, we are sending some of our money to the George Spady Society which is an inner city agency that provides overnight shelter to 72 adults. And they also have 20 beds to detox for adults under the influence. Admission is immediate and offered on a 24 seven a day base basis. We take an offering that allows us to exercise that all important generosity of spirit, an offering that will support the self-supporting church and its many ministries. For those in the sanctuary, you can use the envelopes found on the inside cover of the hymn book if you wish to receive a tax receipt for your gift. Please indicate on the envelope your contact information so we can send you a tax receipt at year end. Many of our members and friends give monthly or annually through automatic withdrawal from their accounts. Offering plates are located at each of the exits. Those in the sanctuary may leave a donation at the end of the service. For those of you online, we encourage you to visit the Charity of the Month website to make a donation. We thank you for your generosity of spirit and action that we all do here in this community and in the wider world. We are involved in the important spiritual work of creation and compassion. Let us sing from you I receive. to invite us all into a spirit of meditation, reflection, contemplation, whatever you like to call it, and a time for us to center ourselves and perhaps look inward, feel our bodies. So to begin, I'm going to invite you to take a couple of deep breaths with me to arrive, to look around perhaps, and really notice what you're seeing. So often we, we, we're kind of rushing through our lives and we, we leave our bodies behind. So now let's just take a couple of deep breaths in and out. In. And out. Notice how your body expands and moves to allow the air to come in and then contracts as the body leaves, as the air leaves your body. Think about how our bodies are so miraculous that they take what they need from the air and then let go of everything it doesn't need. Think about doing that in our lives. We open up and we allow the things that breathe in it bring us life and light. And we let go of those things that no longer serve us. I invite you to feel the chair under you, the floor, the couch, the bed, whatever it is that is supporting you. And then just try to let it lean into it. Let it hold you. Let it hold your weight. Relax your muscles. And take a couple more deep breaths. And I'm going to read a poem by Richard Gilbert called The Flowers Have the Gift of Language. I'm going to read it through once. 
wait a few seconds and read it through again, and then we'll have a few seconds of silence. Speak, flowers, speak. Why do you say nothing? The flowers have the gift of language. In the meadow, they speak of freedom, creating patterns wild and free as no gardener could match. In the forest, they nestle, snug carpets under the foot, under the roof of leaf and branch, making a rug of such softness. At the end tip of branches, they cling briefly before bursting into fruit sweet to taste. Flowers, can you not speak joy to our sadness and hope to our fears? Can you not say how it is with you that your color, the darkest corner? The flowers have the gift of language. At the occasion of birth, they are buds before bursting. At the ceremony of love, they unite two lovers in beauty. At the occasion of death, they remind us how lovely is life. Oh, would that you had a voice, sweet messengers of hope. Would that you could tell us how you feel arrayed in such beauty. For the flowers have the gift of language. They transport the human voice on winds of beauty. They lift the melody of songs to our ears. They paint through the eye and the hand of the artist. Their fragrance binds us to sweet smelling earth. Now read it again and let those images wash over you. Grab onto one and go with it. Speak, flowers, speak. Why do you say nothing? The flowers have the gift of language. In the meadow, they speak of freedom, creating patterns wild and free as no gardener could match. In the forest, they nestle snug carpets under the roof of leaf and branch, making a rug of such softness. At the end tip of branches, they cling briefly before bursting into fruit, sweet to taste. Flowers, can you not speak joy to our sadness and hope to our fear? Can you not say how it is with you that you color the darkest corner? The flowers have the gift of language. At the occasion of birth, they are buds before bursting. At the ceremony of love, they unite two lovers in beauty. At the occasion of death, they remind us how lovely life is. For the flowers have the gift of language. They transport the human voice on winds of beauty. They lift the melody of song to our ears. They paint through the eye and hand of the artist. Their fragrance binds us to sweet smelling earth. Thank you. Ooh, that's so hard on the eyes, isn't it? After that, it's like, whoa. So people come to church for a lot of different reasons, don't you think? 
So many, maybe perhaps you've heard me say this before. The first time I went to church, I was nine days old and I haven't missed many Sundays since. As was sung in the prelude, we are here. We're here together in this holy moment. So we all resisted the urge to play golf, to go for a hike, to go for a drive, because you know what, let's face it, we have so many choices of things to do with our time. No, we all decided in our uniqueness to show up here on Sunday morning to do something of worth. We all long for meaning in our lives. We all long for connection. We're all trying to get answers to those complex questions we are faced with. And so we come to church to find community, to find connection, and sometimes answers. But because we're Unitarians, we usually just find some more questions. I've heard the Reverend Dr. Philip Hewitt say a few times, and I may be repeating myself, I go to church to water the flowers in the garden of my soul. I go to church to water the flowers in the garden of my soul. We are beautiful and unique human beings and mostly made up of water and chemicals. And we need tending, just like any garden. I saw a meme on Facebook, and it said, we're basically just cucumbers with emotions. When I arrived in Edmonton almost exactly one year ago today, I was so excited to see what was here, to understand the complexities of this garden of this congregation, I found to my delight a flourishing garden. And I was excited to begin to understand how this garden grows. The first year of ministry, unless it's a short one or two year interim, is really all about and only getting to know one another. And I believe we are beginning to get to know one another. I know where you blossom and where some of the soil has gone dry and is no longer fertile. You have figured me out a little. You know about some of the things I'm good at and where some of my growing edges are. This is what it means for us to be in ministry together. We, together, tend the gardens of our minds, our hearts, and our metaphorical souls. And I think we're just beginning to understand how we can work together to get some things done. Just like any garden, UCE was and, is, was and is beautiful, just as it is. And just like any garden, it takes constant tending to keep it that way. You know, and having your minister, Reverend Brian Kiley, retired just as COVID ravaged all congregations of every denomination, and then having an off-site minister for a year that may or may not have been a good fit for you, created a situation that resulted in some areas of the congregation needing some extra work. And so you've worked really, really hard to bring those things back to life. Coriolis, and now Coriolis Light, yay, for one. The governance implementation team is full speed ahead. The board is doing great work. We have a new and excellent DRE, Director of Religious Exploration, Oksana Atwood. And the governance team, along with myself, is guiding you through a process where a new mission, vision, and covenant statements is imminent. That in itself is a lot, and you have done so much more. It's important to understand, though, that the garden was here. You were already doing 
wonderful and beautiful things before COVID, after COVID, and all through this year. Because you individually and together are wonderful and beautiful. This is the last time I will be able to speak with you before the summer break. I'll be doing one summer service, but it's for all of the congregations in Mountain Time, and it'll be strictly online. Well, you can, I won't be here in person. So, you know, I was thinking about it. What I, what, what's my last message to you before September 11th when I am back in your pulpit again? And I decided that this was my last opportunity this year to tell you how great I think you are and how much I care about you. As Brene Brown says, we are all hardwired for struggle and we are all worthy of love and belonging. And I would like to go one step further with that. Just as you are, you are lovable and loved. And so one more step further, let's say it together in the first person. And you're going to say this, and I'll repeat it a couple of times for you. Just as I am, I am loved and I am lovable. I'm going to keep saying it and I want you to join me. Just as I am, I am loved and I am lovable. Just as I am, I am loved and I am lovable. That is what the message I want to leave with you this summer. You are loved and you are lovable. You together make up the beautiful garden that is the United United. I was raised in the United Church of Canada, so it just it falls out every once in a while. Just as you are, you make up the beautiful garden that is the Unitarian Church of Edmonton. Thank you. So we're going to sing the Sweet June Days, hymn 6-5. And the words will come up here. And then after this hymn, we're going to do our flower ceremony. Light. I love that. Flower ceremony originated with Norbert Chopik, who was a Unitarian minister, and he lived in the last century in the city of Prague. His home and his church were overrun by German soldiers in the years of World War II. He gave his life defying their cruel occupation. Before he died, he influenced thousands of people with the beauty of his words and ideals, including this flower ceremony 
that he and his wife, Maya, originated. Flower celebration symbolizes the light and color and fragrance of many creeds, many cultures, and many races joining together in a bright, living bouquet. Flower celebration continues to be celebrated in this congregation and countless of others around the globe. A testament to the power of love to withstand hate and to the vision of a tolerant faith which sweeps the world. Flowers assure us that warmth and kindness can pierce through the frost of cruelty and indifference, that mercy and decency will blossom and that goodness will prevail. What seems most fragile and perishable is most persistent and enduring. Justice, charity, and good relations will ultimately prevail. I'm just going to give you a little, very brief history of the flower celebration. And this was um, put together by Teresa and David Schwartz. So Norbert Chappick's mother was a devout Catholic, and his father was agnostic. And he became an acolyte at age 10 in 1890. So he was uh, born in 1880. And in the years that followed, he became quite disillusioned with the church. But at 18, he apprenticed with his uncle, a successful tailor in Vienna. And then he discovered the Baptists, and he became a Baptist minister. And he founded dozens of Baptist churches in uh, Ukraine and Budapest. Yet, slowly, his faith became more and more liberal. And then he moved to the United States and was serving a Baptist church in New York City. Until one day in 1919, he said, I cannot be a Baptist anymore even in compromise. The fire of new desires, new worlds, is burning within me. So Norbert and his wife, Maya Chapek, joined a Unitarian church in New Jersey in 1921. After, and after World War I ended, he returned to Czechoslovakia. And he was the Unitarian minister at the Prague Liberal Religious Fellowship um, and in 20, for 20 years, and um, it had over 3,200 members. He grew it to that. So he, he was disillusioned with some of the other kinds of things that were going on in, this, in, the, in, the, um, in the church, and he, he turned to the beauty of the countryside, to the beauty of flowers. And in 1923, he developed the flower ceremony. So he asked his congregants to bring a flower, just as you have been asked, from their gardens, the field, the roadside. And then he invited them all to place them in a flower or as we have done on a tray. There is the church community. No less unique for being united. Following the service, each person, but we're gonna do that pretty quick. We're going to process and or come and pick a flower. Each person could take a flower from the vase or from the tray, a different one than they had brought. Chopik was a visionary minister with a church ahead of his time, of its time, a bold church, a church thinking beyond its doors, beyond what was thought possible. And for all of his free thinking, he was arrested. The Gestapo arrested him in 1942. And he was accused of listening to foreign broadcasts. That's what put him in Dachau concentration camp. Even in starvation and torture, he held a flower ceremony with his fellow prisoners, finding whatever flowers they could among the weeds of the camp. And they testified to a beauty larger than themselves and the love that would, that would outlive them. The Nazis did kill Norbert Chopic, but his spirit, courage, and commitment live on today. Those qualities have passed now to us to make them real. And his wife, Maya, brought the flower ceremony to the Ukrainian church in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 1940. 
So what we're doing today has been done for decades and decades. People bring flowers that they find and they come together in a unique and beautiful way. And then we take a flower that is different than the one that we brought and we take that home. And this is to represent how we are all unique, how we're all beautiful and how we share in that beauty. We all bring something that someone else can use. So, just as Chop Chopik created this service and Maya brought it to the, to the United States and people all over the world celebrate this flower ceremony, I invite you to now partake in this ceremony. So there's lots, there's many flowers here. Thank you to everyone that brought one. You can line up on this side and then choose your flower looking that way, if you don't mind, towards the camera. And, um, and during the procession, uh, a colleague of mine, Reverend Dan Schultz, will be singing De Colores, and we will be viewing pictures that he put together to accompany his rendition of De Colores. So I invite you now to come and choose a flower Y 
Por eso los grandes amores de muchos colores me costan a mí. De colores, si de blanco y negro, y rojo y azul y castaño. y estrecha la mano son colores son colores de gente que sabe de la libertad y por eso los grandes amores me gustan a mí y por eso los grandes amores de muchos colores me gustan a mí canta el gallo canta el gallo con el kiri 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 La gallina con el cara, 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 cara. Los polluelos, los polluelos con el pío, 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 pío. Y por eso los grandes amores de muchos colores me gustan a mí y por eso los grandes amores de muchos colores me gustan a mí The words mean of colors of colors the field Rest in the springtime. Of colors. Of colors are the small birds that come from so far away. Of colors. Of colors is the rainbow we are just beginning to see shine. And because of this, the great love of many colors for the world, I also love. Y por eso los grandes amores de muchos colores me gustan It's lovely. Flowers are also so wonderful for marking times of transition. And this weekend, our beautiful Alora graduated from high school. And it is our dear friend Art's birthday. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
May the blessing of the flowers be upon you. May their beauty beckon you to each morning and their loveliness lure you to each day and their tenderness caress you each night. May their delicate petals make you gentle and their eyes make you aware. May their stems make you sturdy. That's it. <laughs> and now we're going to sing. <laughs> the choir is going to sing for us. Him, are they going to sing for us? Yes. Him, okay. I do not know the name of the song. Tuimbe. There we are. Okay. <laughs> now we're going to sing <laughs> hymn number 1030 please rise as you're willing and able <laughs>
<laughs> I do not see Daniello. Is he outside? Okay, Vi, you want to come up and help me extinguish stuff then? <laughs> I can call up other people. Vi can be a, a stand-in. Thank you. <laughs> All of us are beautiful. We come in a variety of colors, shapes, and sizes. Some of us grow in bunches. Some of us grow alone. Some of us are cupped inward. And some of us spread ourselves out wide. Some of us are old and dried and tougher than we appear. Some of us are still in bud. Some of us low grow to the ground. And some of us stretch towards the sun. Some of us feel like weeds sometimes. Some of us carry seeds sometimes. Some of us smell. And all of us are beautiful. <laughs> what a beautiful bouquet of people we are. <laughs> and now I offer you this benediction by L.R. Nost for the last time this year until September. My friends, do not be dismayed by the brokenness of the world. All things can break, and all things can mend, but not with time, as they say, with intention. So I invite you to go and love intentionally. Love extravagantly and love unconditionally. For the broken world waits in darkness for the light that is in you. So go in peace, my gentle people. Go in peace. And the choir, Coriolis Light, will be singing one more. And I'm going to mute and run over there. We see them join in the actions of the And now I invite you to sing our linking song, Carry the Flame. If you like, you can move around to the edges, and look, look at one another. Or from wherever you are. <laughs> 